Hi, I'm Dr. Paige Seiper, and I'm the Chief Psychologist at the Seaver Autism Center for Research and Treatment here at Mount Sinai. Today, I'll be talking about autism and sensory symptoms that are commonly observed in individuals on the spectrum. Several different signs can prompt a parent or an individual to seek out an evaluation for autism. When we think about autism, it's a constellation of differences. So differences in the area of social communication and social reciprocity, and differences in terms of restricted and repetitive interests and behaviors. Common social communication symptoms can include difficulty with the acquisition of language or atypical use of language, ranging from individuals with few to no words to those who use repetitive speech, such as echolalia, including those who are highly verbally fluent, but may use overly complex speech, for example. We also look at nonverbal communication. So is an individual using eye contact, pointing and other gestures, a variety of facial expressions to augment their communication attempts. We look at social reciprocity. So is an individual engaging in joint attention, both in terms of initiating it and responding to it? Is an individual engaging in shared enjoyment and showing items of interest to others? In the repetitive and restricted interest domain, we commonly see sensory reactivity differences, including sensory sensitivities. We also see insistence on sameness or a need for routines. We see individuals who can become overly focused on particular topics or objects or at younger ages, the, the specific parts of objects. We can see in young children lining up toys, for example. And we also often see certain repetitive behaviors or motor mannerisms, so hand flapping or body rocking. It's important to note, though, that any individual sign is not by any means indicative of a diagnosis of autism. It's the constellation of those symptoms, as I mentioned earlier. But it's really important that if there are any concerns at any level, to talk to your child's pediatrician or primary care doctor, because all of these concerns are valid and, and should be addressed. I also want to note that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends autism screening at 18 months and at the 24 or 30 month well child visits. So it's not parents' jobs to be experts on autism and to know what to look for in their child. It is something that should be screened routinely during well child visits. Sensory processing issues have received a lot of attention over the past several years. This is largely due to the newest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. And for the first time, sensory reactivity differences were recognized as a core feature of autism. The DSM-5 defines sensory reactivity into three categories hyperreactivity or an over-responsiveness to sensory stimuli. So here we think about sensory sensitivity. So being sensitive to the feel of certain textures or being sensitive to loud sounds or being bothered by the sight of certain objects. There's also hyporeactivity. So this is an under-responsiveness. So this can be a delayed or absent reaction to the sight of a car passing by or to the sound of an alarm or to the feel of pain or temperature. So there's certainly safety concerns involved in individuals who are hyporeactive. And then there's sensory seeking. So an intense interest in the feel and the sound and the sight of certain objects. So when we think about these various um, sensory differences, it's really important for us to recognize that individuals on the spectrum don't always fall into one bucket. We often see individuals who may be um, hyporeactive in certain areas and hyporeactive in others, or in the context of sensory seeking, may enjoy the sound of particular sounds, but may resist the sound of a fire alarm or the sound of a particular type of music, right? There's lots of different combinations of sensory features that we see.
Sensory reactivity differences are reported in up to 90% of individuals on the spectrum. And depending on this study and the way that these uh, features are measured, we have seen even up to 96% in certain studies. So while there is a range, the majority of individuals with autism do show sensory reactivity differences, but it is important to recognize that sensory features in the DSM are part of what we call the B domain or the repetitive and restricted interest domain, where two of four features have to be met. So an individual does not have to have sensory reactivity differences to have autism, although the prevalence is quite high based on current studies. When determining whether your child may require or benefit from a sensory assessment, it's really important to determine whether the sensory reactivity differences that you're seeing are impairing your child's everyday life, whether it's because of the frequency of them, the intensity of them, whether it's interfering with their socialization or their adaptive behaviors or their ability to participate in activities of daily living, whether it's interfering with their functioning at school or attending social gatherings, all of these factors are really important to consider when deciding whether an evaluation that incorporates sensory reactivity would be relevant to your family. The sensory assessment process can involve several different measures. So historically, we were reliant on caregiver report forms where a parent would fill out a rating scale asking many questions about a child's sensory profile. And over the past several years, we at the Seaver Center developed a novel sensory assessment. It's called the Sensory Assessment for Neurodevelopmental Disorders. We also refer to it as the SAND. And the SAND combines a semi-structured a direct observation using specific sensory stimuli, as well as a corresponding caregiver interview. So we want to see within an exam setting, how does a child respond to a bunch of different um, stimuli that prompt sensory uh, reactivity responses. And then we also wanna hear from caregivers, what does, this individual's sensory preferences look like in their everyday life. And so we combine these two sources to assess an individual sensory preferences across visual, tactile, and auditory domains, and across hyperreactivity, hyporeactivity, and seeking. And what this gives us is a really specific individualized profile of an individual's personal sensory preferences, which we can then use to modify environments, to help use an individual's preferences, to help them engage um, more actively and more comfortably in their everyday life. After the sensory assessment, you'll have a really good understanding of an individual's sensory preferences. All of us have our own sensory preferences. Think about whether you're someone who would order a tea extra hot or ask for some ice cubes so it's not as hot, right? Our pain and our temperature thresholds can vary. Some people prefer to work with natural light or lamp light while others want bright fluorescent lights. Some people work well with music or the TV on or in a coffee shop while others need a really quiet environment. So I want you to imagine if you're someone who works well in a quiet environment and you were to take on a new job or be asked to do your homework in a coffee shop, I would imagine it would be much harder to think more clearly and to provide um, your optimal, I guess, thinking and learning, right? Um, and so when we think of it that way, if we can identify an individual sensory preferences, we can modify environments so that individuals are set up for success, so that individuals are more comfortable. And understanding these unique profiles, because everyone's profile is different, is really important. Also, understanding what hyporeactivities might exist. So there are significant safety concerns for someone who might not notice the sound of an alarm suggesting danger, or who might not be able to indicate 
if they're in pain or require medical attention. And then in terms of sensory seeking, this can certainly interfere with focus and attention and engagement with others. And so if we can help individuals develop methods and tools to satisfy sensory cravings, that can also really improve an individual's quality of life. I think the best advice I can give to parents about how to best support their child as they develop is to think about skills and to think about how we can focus on helping individuals develop the skills they need to be as independent as possible and to become as independent as possible. And part of that I think is really ensuring that you have the supports you need in place in whatever capacity that might look like, supports for you as caregivers, supports for your child. You want a team where it feels good when you meet, where the interactions, even if these individuals working with your child are making them work hard, because we know that this is hard work and that developing skills for all of us, learning new skills is hard, right? But it should feel good. So we want everyone to be focused on an individual's personal strengths and on those small successes. We wanna celebrate every success, small and large, and to really use those strengths to help children improve areas that are more challenging for them. There are several different interventions and therapies that have shown efficacy for individuals on the spectrum. Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA, is one evidence-based treatment that can target core and related features of autism. Speech and language therapy can be used for individuals with a variety of different needs, ranging from individuals focused on developing functional communication, both in terms of expressive language and receptive language, as well as the use of assisted technology, both high and low tech. But speech therapy can also focus on more complex aspects of language, such as pragmatic language, so that social use of language. Occupational therapy can focus on sensory reactivity differences, adaptive behavior, fine motor skills, and physical therapy can be helpful for those who may be displaying motor delays or hypotonia, which is low muscle tone that is commonly observed in some individuals with autism. Social skills groups have also demonstrated efficacy. And I think what's really important to think about is what are your or your child's unique needs and unique challenges and strengths and what areas of support are going to best help um, the individual reach their, their optimal potential. The Seaver Autism Center is a multidisciplinary translational research program. We have a large research focus with clinical studies ranging from natural history studies to clinical trials. We also have a large rare disease program where we study individuals with genetic syndromes associated with autism. Through our faculty practice, we offer several clinical services for example, neuropsychological and psychoeducational evaluations, individual psychotherapy for those on the spectrum, as well as for siblings of individuals on the spectrum. We offer parent training and medication management, as well as social skills groups that are run throughout our community. We have several collaborations with cultural institutions, including the Museum of Natural History, the Children's Museum of Manhattan, and the Guggenheim Museum. And throughout um, the past year, we have really focused on improving care and supporting individuals on the spectrum within the Mount Sinai community. So we developed these um, individualized sensory toolkits that are now available at our emergency department. So throughout the health system, we are starting to disseminate them to other specialized practices within Mount Sinai and outside of Mount Sinai with the goal of really improving the patient experience. So each of these toolkits has several sensory tools as well as an information sheet 
that explains to physicians, staff members, parents, individuals on the spectrum, how to use these tools to help satisfy any sensory needs and make the experience more comfortable. Our team has also developed a learning module to train physicians, clinicians, and staff members across different disciplines how to best support the needs of patients on the spectrum, and that's now available throughout the health system. And so we're really thinking about how can we take what we're learning um, through all of these research studies that we're doing and then apply them within the health system and within the community. And so in order to do this most effectively and to make sure what we're doing is actually achieving the intended purpose, we're also collecting data on these various new initiatives to ensure the utility of these um, new programs that we've developed. So a couple of final thoughts. I really wanna mention that I've used the word skill a lot, and I think that's really important. A skill is something that can be learned and developed in many aspects or challenges that individuals on the spectrum face are skill-based. And so I really like to think that by identifying skills and thinking about skills as areas that we can improve upon, that each individual has a ton of potential and that it's our job as parents, as clinicians, or as self-advocates to really think about what are the skills that we want to focus on and how can we use an individual's personal strengths to build skills. It was so nice talking to you today. For more information about the Seaver Center and for a variety of different resources that we have put together, please visit SeaverAutismCenter.org.